Welcome to show number 280 of the Arc Junkies podcast. Today's guest is Christian Cordes, coming to you all the way from the north coast of Germany. Christian is a bit of a welding guru, and we get into topics of gas metal arc welding and gas tungsten arc welding, and discuss the differences between welding in the States versus welding in Europe. There's a lot of differences, but there's also a lot of similarities. I had a great time chatting with him, and we have an awesome conversation. We'll get right into it after a quick word from the supporters of the show. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Everlast Welders. They make great machines at an affordable price. Whether you're just getting into welding or you've been in the game for a while now, Everlast has a machine for you. Check them out today at everlastwelders.com to view a full selection of their stick, MIG, TIG, and multi-process welders and even plasma cutters. Everlast recently released the new Storm 215C, which is a stick, MIG, and plasma unit all in one. You can save money, time, and speed with this unit. The 215C allows you to cut all the parts and then weld them together all on one platform. You can pick up your Storm today for just $1,300. And don't forget, if you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal, use Arc Junkies in the comment section at checkout to get that free Nova foot pedal and TIG Torch upgrade. Everlast Welders. Weld mean, weld great. We're also brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloy, makers of the finest maintenance rods and wires around. If you're a maintenance welder, or you're in the business of doing repairs on heavy equipment, warehouse conveyor systems, trailers, or you just weld in an environment that's less than ideal for welding due to surface contaminants, such as paint, grease, oils, or other hydrocarbons, you need to check out Rock Mount right now. Quit trying to use 7018, 6010, and 70S6 wires on dirty repair jobs. And what you really need is some Rock Mount. These rods and wires are designed to weld stronger and last longer than typical electrodes. And how is that, you ask? Well, they have higher tensile strengths, higher percentages of elongation, and they weld at less amps to reduce heat input, but you still get adequate penetration. Check them out today at rockmountwelding.com to find out how they can help you on your biggest welding challenge. Whether it's repairs, hard facing, or you just need better consumables such as bits, blades, and burrs, the folks over at Rock Mount will get you pointed in the right direction. Check them out at rockmountwelding.com. We're also brought to you by Isotunes, makers of Bluetooth hearing protection. Isotunes are both OSHA and NIOSH compliant to be used as hearing protection in the workplace. Now you can listen to your favorite music or podcast while under the hood without injuring your hearing. You know you need to protect your hearing. Why not make it fun with Isotunes? Check them out today at isotunes.com and use code word ARCHUNKIES10 at checkout and get $10 off your first pair. They also make a sportsman edition for when you're out on the range. We're also brought to you by Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. Your one-stop shop for all your heavy-duty industrial welding needs. They just released the all-new 300C welding machine, and this thing is a game-changer. Now you can run every single process on one machine. That's right, stick, MIG, flux core, aluminum MIG, and both AC and DC TIG welding with high frequency and a water cooler. The 300C also comes with arc effects, so you can actually see what your amps and bolts are going to do to your piece before you even pull the trigger. And as always, Lincoln PowerWaves come with free access to PowerWave Manager, so you can watch your welding variables live on a laptop or external monitor to ensure you're following the given amps and heat input for the various types of work. And don't forget to use the Arc Junkies 10 coupon code and save 10% on welding machines and fume extractors, or use Arc Junkies 20 to get 20% off all gear and accessories when you go to store.lincolnelectric.com. Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. All right, everyone, you know what time it is. Fire your machine, drop your hood, and turn me up five. You're listening to the Arc Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, Jason Becker. All right, Chris, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Thank you for having me in. Oh, no problem. I, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of tried to figure out a good day that, you know, would work for both of us because, hell, you're, uh, for me, you're six time zones to the east. You know, so yeah, trying to that's come right. up with a good date is a uh, good date and time and everything. It's been a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I know um, at you, you have afternoon and here it's evening. It's dark already and yeah. kids are going to sleep. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're based out of Germany. 
Yeah, that's right. Okay, and uh, I'm guessing you were born in Germany? Yeah, I'm uh, born in Germany on the northern side, um, on the coast, and um, that's where I live. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, it's fascinating because I've always wanted to visit Germany. I actually got to land in Munich where I had a two-hour layover on my way to Iraq. Uh, but, like, as soon as we landed, man, I was, like, excited. I was outside checking everything out, and it's, like, freezing cold because it's mid-February. And uh, everybody's like, get inside. And I was like, no, I want to see as much of this country as I can. But they, like, ushered us into a room where we had to, like, stay segregated from everybody. You know, we couldn't, like, walk out, check out the town. Like, you know, we, yeah. we couldn't do anything. It was just there for a quick layover. But I was like, damn, I'd, I'd love to get back over there and see Germany. Like, all my ancestors hail from Germany. My, uh, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, they're both out of Germany. Like, way oh, back cool. in the day, early 1900s. Like, she came over on the boat through Ellis Island and everything. Um, <laughs> so I'd, I've always been fascinated with getting over there and, like, checking it out. You know, I've heard there, there's uh, – we still have family over there that I've never really connected with. Um, you guys have Becker Beer over there. Becker is my last name. Uh, <laughs> so I, I just – I've always been fascinated with, uh, with Germany and Europe and all that. But I, wa- I wanted to have you on the show because I want to talk about some of the differences – um, not just between, you know, Europe and the U S but like how you guys, uh, do welding differently over there. Oh, that's a really big topic. Um, when it comes to tick welding, uh, we've got many processes. We got tick, we got stick and, um, we got the MIG welding, but the most differences are in tick welding. Mm-hmm. Um, the biggest differing is, is um, that in the U S most people are pedal guys. Yeah, and um, if you weld in Germany and you use a pedal, you kind of uh, the guy that uh, does it not the normal way, and everybody in Germany uses a torch switch. Okay. Um, when you look at our tick torches, we don't have like the CK torches with a with a tube. Um, we have bulky tick torches with switches on it, and um, that's one of the biggest differences we have. Okay, yeah, I know a lot of people over here, especially the folks that do anodized uh, aluminum, they use a switch on their torch and they do bump welding throughout the whole yeah. process. Um, yeah. And then depending, like some people in automotive, they prefer to have, you know, a button on their torch. Uh, it just really depends on the, you know, what industry you're getting into. But yeah, a lot of folks over here, myself included, I love running on a foot pedal. I love running a foot pedal too, but, um, you know, I give workshops and classes and if I give these classes, I have to weld with a regular German torch with a switch mm-hmm. because um, the pedals are really expensive here. And a lot of people don't care about having the option of taking off some heat. And, you know, we get learned to take welding, especially aluminum, when you come to the end of the bead and everything gets hot and wanted to get away, um, you have to weld faster. Um, the American way is take off the heat. Mm-hmm. And um, personally, I like to take down the heat uh, with a pedal. And that's, in my opinion, the, the coolest way. But um, here in the, in the industry, um, you can't weld with a pedal all day. We weld really, really big stuff and, and like 50 meter long aluminum constructions. And you don't want to take a pedal 50 meters with you. Yeah, I could see that. Now you gotta get a. You guys gotta look into the wireless foot pedals. They made some advancements in technology. You can just drag that thing all over the shop with you. But I, yeah, I see yeah, your point. I, like just having everything right there on the torch, you know, makes life a lot easier. And then just being able to control heat input through speed. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a complete different um, different understanding of of how to to react to the paddle and the heat in the part. And, um, you know, we don't use the 4T, uh, the 2T mode. We use only 4T. And um, for long beats, we just bump the trigger on the torch. The arc comes on, we weld. And when we want to end the weld, we tip it again. Mm-hmm. And um, we have some machines that are able to, to give us some control about the amperage while welding with up-down switches. You can um, take five amps down, five amps up, or 10, um, just how you want. But every little motion you have to do with a finger on a torch means motion on the tungsten. Yep, and, and you'll be able to see differences in your weld. Yeah, yeah. 
um, mainly because the the industry asks for fast welders and and effective welders um, you don't have time to to run to your machine take off 20 amps run the next beat and um, they just want you to be fast mm-hmm. and as fast as possible now you, you guys have a lot of different machines over there so like we're in the u.s like our our top two competitors for like industrial you know heavy duty machines are lincoln and miller and from what i've heard like over in europe you guys have like 40 different manufacturers of like yeah. high-end welding machines and like over here yeah. in the u.s we we've got two yeah i know that um we have one miller dealer right here um, in my area um but miller is not a not a well-known brand here in germany or in europe uh lincoln a little bit more they start to raise up here and um i will get a lincoln machine on the net read and uh, try out what the lincoln machine can do mm. but um as you say we have over 40 um 40 um manufacturers of tick welding machines and personally i weld with a weco which is an italian made machine um a handmade italian machine so um you know when it comes to to um, getting known a machine and and searching for the right machine um you guys have two and here you stand before the 40 manufacturers and everybody wants to tell you that their machine is the best Mm -hmm. and like i know fronius is like slowly making you know cutting out a corner in the market over here as well and like going from a lincoln or a miller to a fronius uh i mean there's a lot more settings and stuff built in there because you guys take welding to the next level yeah, when it comes to, to settings, um, I think we are a little bit crazy, um, mainly because we don't use the pedal. So um, the setting has to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And um, the setting has to be perfect for a good start, for a good beat and for a good ending of the world. So when I try to set my machine... I always use a hot start on aluminum. I can start with 150 amps, and after one second, the machine goes down to 100 amps, for example. Okay. And um, with the Weco or a Fronius or, um, you know, all the other manufacturers we have here, we can do crazy stuff. We can combine AC and DC welding in one process. So it makes the paddle really, really acting um, not like aluminum, more acting like stainless. Wait, what? uh, So you you, you can, like, during your arc on time, you have the ability to switch AC and DC while you're welding? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, the best example is um, you take your regular AC welding. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe let's talk about the balance of, of 70% EM and um, let's take 100 hertz frequency, which is a pretty much a standard. Mm-hmm. Um, then I say, okay, I've got a cycle time of one hertz. And within the cycle, it's like a pulse cycle. I say, okay, run the AC side for like 50 or 60% of the cycle. And then run the DC side on the other time. So while I'm welding, I combine both processes, which means the machine just don't make your regular AC sound. Mm -hmm. It switches back and forth. Holy shit. So you got a really crazy ad. And where both processes are uh, working out and um, it's pretty heavy to getting used to that and, and pretty irritating the first times you went with that, but you get a lot deeper penetration. Yeah, I was going to say, so when you run that DC cycle, you're probably running DC negative for more penetration. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty new technique. Um, I think it's just oh, five or four years old Um the first machines came out and, and it's pretty hard to dial in um, because you have to, that's a T time, the AC time has to be um, in a good in a good way of the cycle so you get enough cleaning. Mm-hmm. Also good penetration, but let's take a, a standard weld, um, like, a, like a fillet weld on some five or six millimeter um, aluminum. I can get almost doubled penetration with this process 
Okay, and then you don't have to worry about the tungsten destroying itself because you're you're constantly back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say a two point four millimeter tungsten. I don't know the the inch. I think um, that's, uh, I think two point four is eighth inch. It's uh, yeah. It's a um, it's a standard size tungsten. You know, we all use it for two hundred amps. And um, normally, you say on on AC with a tungsten like this, two hundred amps, two hundred ten, two hundred twenty is the maximum. Okay, no, I was wrong. It's three thirty second. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. You don't want to push that tungsten way over two hundred mm-hmm. on AC. When I'm welding with this combined technique with AC and DC, I don't care about my amps. I weld this tungsten up to 350 amps. Holy shit. Okay. So we take the the AC part and give it maybe 180 amps for the cleaning. But for the penetration side, where I weld in DC, I push full 350 amps out of the machine. Okay. And uh, that's that's some really, really crazy stuff and, and really hard to dial in. But once you've got a cool setting, it's amazing how fast you can weld and um, how better the quality of the weld is. Now, I, I wonder, what what's that whole process called? What do they refer to that as? Is there like a specific uh, name for it? Yeah, they, they got uh, different names. Uh, Weco calls it ACDC Mix. Um, and, and we also call it the mix function. Okay. You know, when we talk about here in Germany about uh, tick welding and, and processes, um, I say, yeah, do you try the mix function of your machine? And then the other guy knows what I mean. Okay. Cause I want to say that, um, on the Lincoln machines like I've got an aspect 375 and they've got a setting called like B I L V. I'm wondering if that's what it is. Cause I asked my rep, I was like, what, what, what's this B I L V thing on here? And he's like, Oh, that's, they use that a lot in Europe. So I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering if that's it. And I've had this technology in my shop this whole time and I haven't like had a chance to mess with it. Cause I'm like, Oh, we don't do that over here. You know, like Americans kind of get a lot of, you know, really ignorant about shit. And they're like, Oh, you know, yeah. Europeans are using it. We don't need to mess with that. I'm standard AC, <laughs> standard DC. Uh, so now, now you've intrigued me. I want to go back into the shop probably Monday when I get back and start messing around with BILV and see if that's like a, I'm guessing like by level to where it can switch from AC to DC, but I could be way off um, base. I think, I think you're off um, because almost any machine here has a by level function. Okay. And, and what this is, is, um, you know, when we weld with a torch switch, mm-hmm. we have the 4T mode activated. Yep. Um, there's no hand on the trigger. And when I just bump the trigger for like 30 milliseconds, the machine goes to a second amp. I can set the machine to, you know, I want 63% of my main amps Mm -hmm. as my bi-level function. And with just bumping the switch, the machine goes down to 63% or 73%, just what I wanted at. And when I bump it again, it goes high. Okay. So that's just basically the same um, what you guys do when taking off a pedal. Okay. Uh, you can take your pedal way off to grab another rod of filler wire, or you just go back a little bit because everything gets hot. I got gotcha. you. And uh, we do that with just the bump. It's probably because you guys use the bump instead of the pedal all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So now, have you ever messed around with, like, um, like Amphenol adjustments on the machine? Like, I know we were talking yes. about it earlier to where you can, you know, you, you're going to end up and see that in your weld. But I know that certain manufacturers have either, like, a toggle switch where you can uh, drive your amps up or down as you're welding. Or they have kind of like a, a track, like you would see on an excavator or something like that, like a little, like a long wheel. And you can adjust yeah, the yeah. temperature as you're going. Um, as you might know, I um, also sell tick torches here in Germany, and uh, we we hand build these things. Um, the most common way is you have a switch. Okay. Um, and then there are two other ways. One is called up down, which means uh, you have a toggle. You can go up or down an amperage, um, but the machine has to be able to do that. You know, I, I put the finger on the toggle for up. And the longer I push the finger on the toggle, the faster the machine will go up in amperage or down, just what I'm doing. 
Um, the other way is um, the little wheel you talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, we sell these torches, but mainly they are not used for, for adjusting the amps uh, while welding. Um, it's more like you're standing on a, on a shipyard and the machine is like 500 feet away from you and um, you don't want to run to the machine to change your amps. So that's just like um, the old days in, in stick welding where you have your little box and set your amperage at and just for the lazy guys who don't have a helper or want to run to the machine. Mm -hmm. Well, now they're coming out with like wireless remotes and shit. So, I mean, you could be like, you know, a certain distance away from your machine and have your amperage and voltage right there in a little control panel. It's completely yeah. wireless. And I'm waiting for the day. It's probably, I don't know how soon it's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure that technology is going to be put into a cell phone very yeah. soon I, yeah. I could see that as being the next step you know because nobody wants to drag around a remote but everybody's always got their cell phone in their pocket uh so being able yeah, to I, um, adjust your engine drive or your your machine in your shop just you know right there on the on the thing i mean hell 3m just released their their g502 welding hood and it's got a bluetooth app and you can yeah, monitor yeah. arc on time arc off time like all kinds of stuff through you know an app in your cell phone yeah we got some uh, machines um some machines from Finland, uh, Campy machines, which are really awesome tick machines uh, where you can upload a screensaver with a picture. So you can say, my welding machine has a screensaver of my family or of my, of my motorcycle or whatever you want. And uh, I got that machine here for testing. It had a, has a huge TFT display. And uh, I put my logo on the machine, which looks really, really cool. But uh, yeah, that's, that was pretty, pretty crazy. That and we cool. also also got some machines where you already can set, like the MIG machines, you have a little Bluetooth box, um, take that with you and set your process and your amps with Bluetooth. Oh, that's cool. So I want to talk a little bit about tungsten because, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, in, in Germany, probably uh, good parts of Europe, you guys refer to it as Wolfram, right? Yeah, yeah. So instead you of know. TIG welding, you guys do wig welding. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, it's pretty, pretty awesome when I talk, um, you know, you, just Instagram, you talk about TIG welding with so much people in the world. And um Sometimes when I talk to, to people here in Germany, I also say tick mm -hmm. because I'm so used to it. And they, they just look at me and uh, what are you doing? And you know, it's called Vic and <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. This, uh, my buddy, Ryan Eubank told me about that. And I was like, man, that's like a little, that's like a cool piece of knowledge to have, you know, in your back pocket It's like, because on the periodic table elements, the tungsten uh, designation is W yeah. for, for Wolfram. And, yeah. you know, so I was just wondering if that's like, you know, that's what you guys typically refer to it or is if you've adopted TIG or if you, you know, still call it, uh, well, I guess you, because the, uh, the pronunciation you call it, you guys call it fig welding or fig welding. Yes. Yes. That's right. Because, um, you know, the, the full, um, description is, uh, Wolfram in the So, um, we just say Wolfram welding. Mm hmm and um, it's the same with MIG welding. I think in the US you call everything MIG welding. Um, Devon care, it's, it's steel or, or aluminum and, and here we only say MIG welding when we weld aluminum. Okay, because you're actually using an inert gas at that point. That's right, that's right. Not because you have um, like a mix of active and inert gas in there. So like the, yes. over here, you get people that call it MIG welding, and then you have like the highfalutin people that are like, you know, uh, really high into codes and specs. It's like I, I got a buddy, uh, Dr. Scott Helzer, and when I talk to him, I know that I can't say MIG, TIG, or stick or anything like that. I have to refer to it as um, gas metal arc welding <laughs> or, you yeah. know, gas tungsten arc welding or shielded metal arc welding. I have to use the actual, you know, per, uh, appropriate or, or proper terms. You know, yes, when, yes. and it depends on who you're having a conversation with. But if I'm chatting with somebody on Instagram or, you know, just MIG, TIG, stick, whatever. Um, but yeah, so you guys, you guys only call it MIG with aluminum. Now, when you're using uh, gas metal arc welding for steels and stainlesses, what are you referring it to? Is it like, it like mag welding for? Yes, yes. Um, metal it's, it's called, yes, it's called mag welding or mag welding in Germany because uh, the active gas. Okay. And um, here, when you talk to somebody about uh, MIG welding and 
and say MIG welding and you mean he has to weld steel, right? people get really crazy and throw a hammer at you because you <laughs> used the wrong term. <laughs> I can see that happening. <laughs> so what are, what are some of the other differences between like, I mean, just vernacular, like what you guys call things over there and what we call them over here? Uh, I think that our, the, the most interesting are TIG, WIG and, and all the stuff like that. Um, but I think if I think long enough, uh, there are many terms in welding, um, or even in the metal production where, um, Germans just say stuff a little bit crazy. It's, you know, we have an extra word for everything. So, um, talking in detail to somebody can really funny sometimes. Okay. And then when going back to the Wolfram or tungsten, which uh, like composition do you prefer to do most of your welding? Are you switching out between like uh, E3 or serrated, lanthanated for going from steel to stainless to aluminum? Or do you have one that's like a good recommendation for all the different types of alloys? Um, yeah, it's a little bit challenging because we use the, the transformer machines, um, you know, like so many years here in Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, and the first transformer machines um, that had a, a setting to to um, change the balance were developed here in Germany. So a lot of um, a lot of people only know transformer machines, um, especially the old welders we have here, and they use pure tungsten for the aluminum for the AC welding, and they use foriated for the DC welding. And in the last two or three years, um, there was a big turnaround because uh, everybody said, hey, thoriated is um, really not good for your health and all the shit like that. And one um, Binzel came out with their E3, mm -hmm. um, which is basically a 1.5 uh, lanthanated electrode with some other stuff. and. Um, nowadays we have to have to differ that you have um, two kinds of industries here you have um, the little shop guy who has like 40 employees and, and doing all stuff of metal work he's building a fence or um, just everything you know the little guy um, that works for everybody and, and it's a classical classical metal guy you can go to him and hey turn me apart on the lathe or weld me that big steel construction. And he does that. Like a job shop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other side is the, the high industry, you know, and, and aerospace and all the stuff like that. And, um, well, the, the little shop guy, um, prefers one tungsten for all. He don't want to spend money for two systems. So the little guy just takes, uh, you know, a 1.5 gold is very common here. Um, or the uh, um, 2 percent lanthanated blue tungsten mm -hmm. and run these for everything. So um, the employees don't have to mess with two different sorts. It's not a problem when the color gets off and, and everybody can take a tungsten and weld with it. I got you. The other side is um, like the welding I am doing here is I have um, a tungsten I use mainly for DC welding, which is um, most of the time um, um, like a, a little bit better than a trimix you have. It has four percent of additives. Okay. It's called it's called Litty Lumox Lux. It's a really expensive tungsten, but you can push this thing really hard. And the other side on AC, I use Wolfram Industry tungsten. Um, they have a tungsten called Alustar. Um, some guys in the U.S. use that too because um, these things are so amazing when it comes to AC. But then you have to say, okay, I've got two separate systems. I don't mix these systems. You can't mix them. You have to take like different containers where you put your tungsten in. So when the color gets off, you don't have to worry which is which. And But I think when you want to do really, really, really good welds, you need two different tungsten systems. Okay. I've, I've got a buddy. I want to tell you a funny story. Uh, when I was with the iron workers, because we always, uh, we always had the short back caps, so we would cut our tungstens in half. 
And, you know, like once you cut your tungsten in half, you, you lose that color. You yeah. Know, whatever the color of the band was, because we, we cut them in half and then we sharpen both ends, you know, just to be able to like be contaminate or whatever, you quick change, flip it over. And then, you know, run it back in there. If your tungsten gets, you know, a little bit of stuff on it, you just flip it over. Uh, so one day I was like going through his gang box, grabbing something. I can't remember what I was getting out of it. And I was like, dude, why do you have fingernail polish in your gang box? That's, that's a little weird to, you know, like have in your, your toolbox. Yeah. But he's got them for the specific colors of tungsten. So he's got like a blue, a red, a green. So depending on what he's working on, he can, you know, cut the tungsten in half, sharpen both ends, and then take the fingernail polish and paint on the tungsten in the center, what color it actually is. And so it, oh, it maintains that color and you never, you never mix up, you know, was this pure tungsten or was it 2% thoriated or was it lanthanated, you know, or seriated? Yeah. He's got all the different colors in there. And I was like, that's freaking brilliant. You know, just to be able to not mix everything up, because like you said, when you're when you're welding steel and stainless, you know, you've got one go to. And then when you switch over and use, uh, you know, like pure tungsten, if you're running on a transformer rectifier machine, you got like pure tungsten. So that's green. You put a little dab of green on there and the color maintains itself. Yeah, that's really cool. Really a nice story, I think. Um, um, if you take that problem, you've got like, you know, three tungstens. Mm hmm. You're out on a job and um, you don't know which tungsten is which. Um, you know, there are jobs um, where it's not a problem if you dip in or you have a contamination. It's just well push it together and it's okay. Mm -hmm. But on a really critical job, um, that can be a problem when you're standing for your machine and you don't know which tungsten is which. Um, when you take uh, like a 2% lanthanated, it is a really good all around tungsten, I think. Um, they run good. Um, you can push them to, to 200 amps. They start good. But I think there is one big problem. When you take a lanthanated tungsten and weld a long bead, the lanthium will burn off the tungsten. And let's say after one meter of welding, there is no lanthanum on the tungsten anymore in the front end. At that moment, you got that really big ball and all the little nodules on your tungsten mm -hmm. just because there is only pure tungsten and garbage in the tungsten. So that's the, the, the bad side of an all-around tungsten. They, they lose their good properties on long weld runs. You have to cut them off, resharpen them, and with a special aluminum tungsten, you don't got the problem. It's no problem with an with a Alustar to ride like two meters welding. Okay. So what, what type of work are you doing that, that causes you to have to weld these long runs with uh, like gas tungsten or wig welding? instead of, you know, switching over to a gas metal arc welding system? Oh, well, um, I learned the trade um, over 16 years ago in shipyards. And um, we were a repair shipyard, so we don't build many new stuff, mainly repair work and, and heavy work. And um, the MIG process wasn't so established in Germany. So, yeah, we know we can take a machine and, and well mix with it, but um, we learned to tick that stuff. And then you had a, a, like, a, like a little life-saving rescue boat or stuff like that and then weld some, some aluminum plate on it. So the shop foreman came in and said, hey, yeah, I, I want this weld to be welded in one shot. And the weld was like two meters long, and then you just have to. Okay. It's just, um, you know, on a part where the weld is, is withered and we want high quality parts. Um, you don't want to see a start stop like on the, on the rail or something like that. It has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And then I know in, in specific uh, specifications and stuff, you're the, the type of TIG the, or the type of uh, Wolfram that you're using or tungsten that you're using, it's considered an essential variable. So, you know, yeah. if they say you have to use lanthanated, that's what you're using. You can't say, well, you know, I prefer 2% thoriated because that's what I've always used. It do doesn't matter. What's it say on the weld spec? That's what you actually yeah. have to use. Yeah, yeah, there's no way around. Um, when you take um, a weld test here, um, let's say, for example, in, in MIG welding, you weld with um, a mix of argon and 10% helium, and you weld with a one millimeter wire. 
your well test is only for one millimeter rail mm -hmm. and this type of gas mix. Let's say I change the bottle and use a 30% helium mix. My well test doesn't work anymore because I did the test on another gas. Correct. Yeah, we got and the same thing here. We get uh, plus or minus. It depends on the percentages and stuff. Yeah. But it, like you'll, depending on the uh, the type of procedure that you run, and you can get like a 5 to 10% plus or minus within, yeah, that, yeah. within that area. When um, it comes to like um, the welding sheets we have on, on high critical parts, um, we call that um, WPS. It's like a, it's like a little sheet um, where the settings of the welding machine are documented. Mm -hmm. And let's say I have to use a pulse process, and on my machine I used it. It was program nine, and it's it's a program you can't change anything on. Um, you have to weld with program mine and let's say like 30 volts. If you are a fast welder and you say, hey, I can get way more out of this, so you don't, you are not allowed. You have to use these settings. Yeah, that's, I know they've, uh, uh, welding equipment manufacturers have gone to the links of being able to allow supervisors, managers, shop foremans, whatever the case may be, the ability to set the procedure into the machine and then lock it. Yeah. So now you can't even, you can't even screw unless you have a code or a USB to unlock it. You know, if they set you on mode number nine with 130 amps, that's all you're getting. You can go over there and twist that knob as much as you want, but it's not going to go anywhere because that machine's locked to that yeah, specific that's right. procedure. Yeah, that's right. Or um, sometimes you, you weld parts, um, uh, they take a little box, put that little box on your, on your ground lead. And while you are welding the live part, they are recording like the amperage and all the stuff that goes through the ground lead. And, um, you know, uh, everybody sees uh, what you've done in that weld. So that's um, pretty cool. It's, it's pretty crazy sometimes. Lincoln actually has it on their, their power wave manager. You can plug in an ethernet cable. And I, like I've seen specific instances where they'll take a shop or a school and they'll have like, you know, 20 different welding machines in there. And they'll plug the Ethernet cable into the back of it so they can track everything that's going on. All of your arc on time, peak yes. amperage, average amperage, the joules that you're actually welding into, uh, like heat input, like everything. And then you can even hook that up to a monitor so you can look right over the booth or in that weld station and you can see exactly what that person is running. Their specific yes. voltage and wire feed speed, amperage, like the whole nine yards. It's really cool uh, just to be able to have access to that kind of data. Yeah, it's a really cool stuff. And um, here it was like 10 years ago that uh, stuff came out in the welding schools and at the uh, test centers. And now we have this stuff in, in the normal job life. Mm -hmm. and, and it's pretty amazing how far technology has gone um, on this simple topic like welding. Yeah, that's one of the cool things. We, we just became an accredited testing facility at the school that I teach at. So you know, like as part of like the gas metal arc welding or, you know, like doing like a pulse spray or pulse uh, transfer with those different welding procedures, I still have to calculate the joules or the heat input. But the cool yeah. thing is like, I'll still do it manually, but then I can look at the front of the machine while the person's welding and, you know, check and make sure that they're getting the right amount of joules. But it's like, uh, it's a good redundancy to say, yeah. okay, yes, they're actually hitting, you know, what's on the welding procedure specification because that's a new variable in the 2020 edition of the code book is calculating heat input for gas metal arc welding processes because there's so many different variations of pulse spray and everything. You, you, you got to calculate the peak amperage. Uh, so just having that as a redundancy to be able to look at the front of the machine and say, yeah, my math was correct or, oh man, my numbers are off. I need to go back and, and do my math again to make sure that, you know, they're, they're following the procedure to, to the spec. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's, it's pretty cool, like, how technology, I mean, it's like you're, you're welding with a computer now. So it's yeah. not like, I mean, the transformer machines back in the day, they were great, you know, because they're, they're built like a brick shit house and they're going to last, you know, 40 years or better. Uh, but, like, the new inverter with the amount of technology that's built into the system to be able to check and verify and, and tweak things, it's just, it's insane. So, you know, yeah. like, now's a great time to be a welder because understanding these different variables, what they do, what heat input actually is, does what your wire feed speed does or what voltage means or you know even setting up for your tig process when you go through and you you have the ability to write your own sine wave 
you know, when you're doing your yeah. TIG welding with your, your, your frequency and your balance and all that other, the pulse, the, you know, everything that goes into it to make sure that, you know, when you put a part out, no matter who does the part, you can track the variables and say, yes, they, they followed this procedure. And, yeah. you know, the part is, you know, once we put it in service, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a pretty amazing, um, just in, in MIG welding um, here in Germany, many, many, many welds were done with pulse transfer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Germany is well known, I think, for a lot of uh, steel welding um, in this process. And uh, like five years ago in our shop, we had um, some from workers, they had only one job. They had a little uh, chisel and they take off the little nodules from the, from the short transfer MIG welds. So there were like five people that had this job and, you know, coming off the street and getting like 10 bucks an hour. And uh, now we use the pulse transfer and, and these people don't have a job anymore. So that's the other side of all this technology. Yeah, because you don't have to take the spatter off anymore. There's no spatter yeah. in your head. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Damn. Yeah, I guess that would, that would make sense. You know, you switch over to a pulse spray transfer, the spatter's gone. Yeah, that's right. That's like my you buddy know, these... uh, Nate Bowman always says, like, the best anti-spatter you can have is the correct settings. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, if you get the machine dialed in, you shouldn't have to worry about spatter. It's no, it's no longer an issue, especially with pulse spray. And if yeah. you got spatter with pulse spray, your settings are all jacked up or your contact yeah. tip to work distance is, is way off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So now, how did you, how did you get into teaching? Because you run, like, little workshops to do TIG weld. Actually, hold on. I want to back that up. Uh, how did you learn how to weld initially? Um, well, um, at the age of, of, you know, 13 or 14 years old, um, the neighbor from my parents came to me and, um, he said, Hey, do you want to learn how to weld? And uh, like a little kid I was, I was, um, always outside and, and working on tractors and lawnmowers and stuff like that. And yeah, I want to learn how to weld. And this guy was an old pipe welder so with my you know 13 14 years um every day i came home from school i go over to the neighbor and and he gave me some old welding rods and just sat me in a corner with some some garbage and i welded the stuff together and um that's where where um, i got hot for welding as i would say and when I start uh, the career in the shipyards and they said, um, you know, here in Germany, when you want to weld um, as a job, you have to do all the tests. But um, as a job shop guy, you always learn how to weld, even if you don't use it in your normal job, because they just say it's part of the education. Mm -hmm. Um, they did a really good job. They let us weld stick. They let us weld tick and make and in all positions and stuff like that. And they did it really good. So so um, I got a pretty good basic to to start out. And uh, my career got a little bit different. I, I studied again, became a shop foreman, um, like it's, uh, the master of a shop, like in America. I got the um, new workers. I have to show how to do their stuff. Um, I wrote offers for our customers and um, more not so the practical side, like just sitting on the computer and, and stuff like that. But um, one big part of my job is taking the young people and show them how to weld, how to use the lathe and all the stuff like that. Um, I think in America, it's like a, like a trade school mm -hmm. um, where you learn all that stuff. And after a trade school, you go on a job. And um, here in Germany, we have an education that goes three and a half years. Um, you go like one day to the school, you do your, your little theory stuff and the other four days of the week, you learn your job on the job site. Okay. Um, and what, what age does that start? Uh, mainly 16 years, nice. 16 to seven years. And you know, the, the kids finish their school 
and then they take this education to learn like um, the craftsmanship and, and the trade um, we do this combined way with the schools and with um, with us to teach them the practical side so that's the big part of my job to show people how to do stuff in the trade and around one year ago i started this instagram thing which um, which went really really good for me you know i started exactly 30 months ago and now i'm talking about a little over five thousand followers and um I always wanted to teach welding here in Germany a different way. When you learn welding in Germany as a hobbyist, um, you go to a, like, a, like a trade school and there are 20 people that want to learn too. And in front there is a, like an old guy and doing one weld and hey, yeah, go into your welding booth and try on your own. And that's, that's not the right, um, the right way to teach. The way I give the workshops and the classes is I only take two persons here in my shop and um, I can show them everything in detail. I can put my hand on their tick torch while they are welding and say, hey, look on the length of your arc and all the stuff like that. And that's the approach I got. And um, it started out pretty good because um, I am one of the first guys here in Germany that started a welding school like this. Okay. That's pretty slick. That's, um, so kind of going back, that's what I've always heard about, you know, how Germany does it is called the the German apprenticeship program or gap and yeah. you know, where they kind of identify you as whether you're going to go off into blue, what we call over here, blue collar, you know, like technical skills, hands on, or you're going to go off to university and then they specifically train you for those things. So like, if you identify you're going to university, that's kind of when you start your path, um, like around, you know, age 12 or something like that. And then if you're going to get into skilled trades, that's the route you're going to go over here. So you'll you kind of do like what you were saying, you know, you go one day for theory, and then the other four days, you're like out on the job site kind of learning everything. Yeah, that's right. That's a really cool way to do it. And I, I think we, we waste so much freaking time over here pushing people into, into college. It's like not everybody's meant to go to college. You know, let people do what yeah. they're good at, what they want to do. You know, like don't force them, you know, another four or three years in high school to go off into pursuing, you know, getting a degree when they've got all these, these skills, you know, and they learn different than everybody else. Send them off into, you know, getting a skilled trades because over in Europe, you guys kind of value, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys value skilled trades just like you would, you know, somebody going into university. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, um, here in Europe, um, we have to take that decision at the age of 14 or 15 um, because when you're 15, you're, you're 15, 16, you're out of school. Mm -hmm. um, then you only have have two opportunities. One is um, just go longer to school and, and do the university stuff or go on the job. But when you go on the job, you have a, like a, a standard program. You know, um, we've got uh, pretty strong regularities how I have to teach these young people. And when they, they got their little diploma after three and a half years, this tells everybody here in Germany, hey, this guy can do his trade. And that's one of the biggest beneficials, I think. And it's not like, hey, he's a tradesman or he's working like, like with a hammer and stuff like that. And that guy did go to school longer and, and didn't make more money. That's not the same here. Um, it's more like um, you can say that the, um, the classical... The classical craftsmanship is, is like on the same level as a employee of a bank or, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Cause like over here for the longest time, like blue call, you know, blue collar trades, they were kind of looked down on like, Oh, you uh, okay. weren't, you weren't smart enough to get into school. So you became a welder or, you know, you're not, you didn't get a good enough uh, score on your SATs. So you couldn't get into law school. So you're, you're an electrician. And it's like, no, it's, I have no desire to get into that type of work. I want to work with my hands. I want to be a carpenter. Yeah. I want to be a welder, uh, yeah. a plumber, you know, electrician. I mean, those are all honorable skill sets to have. 
because yes. that's, that's yes. the first person you call when, when your septic system backs up or, you know, when the power's not working in your house or when the Wi-Fi goes down, God forbid. Like, you're calling somebody blue collar that you look down on the other six days of the week to come out and fix your stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's not the same here. Um, as, a, as a plumber or a welder, um, you're just a normal guy that just want to build stuff with his hands. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got a pretty good standing um, and stuff like that here in Germany. And if you go just one step higher, um, I think, let's say in America, you've got the normal worker and above that, you've got the shop foreman. Mm -hmm. And here in Germany, I have to go two years to school um, beside to my job in the evening um, to become like a approved shop foreman. But if you are a approved shop foreman, which is called a Meister here in Germany, um, you're just the same like a doctor or, or anything else. So they don't look down on you. Okay. And that's some pretty cool stuff, I think. You said they're called a Meister? Yeah. That, yeah. I love that. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> that's, I've, I've always heard that term through, through, or thrown around, but I didn't realize that that's exactly what it meant. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit uh, a problem. Um, when I got that certificate, um, like it was, I think, 2014, I said, hey, I need that in English because we have like customers over in the USS and I have to explain the US customers what I am. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, um, you, you just can't say Meister. Uh, they don't know what that is. So um, they said it's like Bachelor of Metal Production, Engineering and Head of Manufacturing. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so this long term is what they said is what I have to say officially when I'm talking to a US person. But if I say that long term, uh, you know, nobody cares about that shit. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I don't know, man. I think uh, Weldmeister is like a badass title. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's pretty slick. So now what, what, what was it that prompted you to kind of start your own school or, or training programs to be able to like reach out and talk to people and, and train them in the ways of welding? You know, um, I've got a pretty good net, um, network here in Germany. I know many of the dealers. I know many, many of the manufacturers um, because of my main job. And mm. um, after I started this Instagram thing, um, where I intended just to show my hobby welding, it became really, really crazy. Like people wrote me like 50 messages a day and how do you set your machine to do that? And how do you weld that? And after some months they said, hey, you can teach that stuff really good. I want to send you some money and say, thank you. Um, then the idea in the head came up and hey, if, if these people say thank you and just send me money because I told them some stuff um, for free and, and I don't want to make money with that, why not making a business out of that? So like teaching people is, um, is what, what fills my life with, with happiness and I love to teach people and it seems like I pretty good at teaching stuff so um yeah it just works that's pretty cool so like how'd you get um like start reaching out and getting clients and and people to show up to to be able to teach them um mainly the most uh, stuff came from instagram um that's you know we've got a pretty pretty small welding community here in germany so everybody knows the other guy and this is just 20 kilometers away from us and everybody talks to each other like everywhere in the welding community we all talk to each other and um, the beginners um, started to reach out to some of my buddies who, who sell welding machines here in germany and they said hey here go to christian he can tell you how to weld and um, just by by this you know good talking from good friends i got my customers okay and then like when, when you have this stuff set up, so we, like we were talking about, you know, how people kind of choose the trade that they're getting into in Germany, you know, what if you choose the, the path to be an electrician and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, you know, like this is cool and all, but like that guy over there playing with fire and, you know, electricity and all that stuff, that's, that's really cool. How do you transition from one career to the next 
you know, can they, is that something they can come to your shop and learn how to do that and develop a proficiency and then they kind of break out into the industry as a welder? Oh, no. Uh, I think, um, you know, as we have so hard tests to become a certified welder, um, I don't give out like a, a diploma to somebody who welds here. Um, like 80% of my customers or 75% of my customers are private people, just like hobbyist welders. Okay. Or they are already certified and specialized welders who want to go to the next level. I got you. Well, let's talk mainly like, let's talk DC welding. When you're a production welder, you set your machine to straight DC and maybe 100 amps and weld your shit. Um, these guys came to me and said, hey, I want to learn how to use pulls. And um, we take a tick machine and make like a nine or 10 hour workshop only with pulse welding and pulse settings. Um, that's where it really, really goes into detail. I've got a different approach of how I see an arc or how I see a weld or I set a welding machine because um, five years of my career, I was um, like a head of a testing laboratory where we were deep into metallography and, um, you know, taking welds and, and materials, looking at them under a microscope and all the stuff like that. So um, I think I can go pretty deep in detail when it comes to how a material reacts or how an arc reacts if I set a pulse. Mm -hmm. So like when, when you're doing all this stuff, like what's the, um, what, what codes and specs are you guys using? Uh, do you have something different in Europe or have you have adopted like the, uh, what we do over here in the, a with the AWS? I think they adopted uh, most, most stuff. And um, so just to, you know, somebody builds a product here in Germany, wants to sell it to the US or like somewhere like in Italy, where is another code. Um, I think they are all pretty much like the same. There are not so many differences. Okay. Cause I know like a, like a red seal welder from the CWB, the Canadian welding bureau, like a lot of their certs, codes, and specs and standards have been adopted throughout, you know, internationally. And then yeah. you have some codes through AWS, you know, that'll transfer internationally. Like when I did my um, my 3 and 4G 1-inch Unlimited, they call that an A1. So that's recognized internationally uh, yeah. throughout. And in each obviously each country is going to have their, their standards of whether they'll accept that or not. But I was just wondering if you guys had a specific code and standard over there in Europe or specifically in Germany that, uh, that you guys create over there? Because you were talking about doing yeah. micro and macro etches and all that stuff. Yeah, the, um, there were some um, some own specifications we had here, but um, they were almost equivalent to the international standards. Okay. So when the customer back in the days came to me and said, hey, I want a test like one, two, three, A, B, I said, hey, okay, I can, I can give you three, five, four, B, C, which is the same. It's, it's just um, another name for it or another standard, but um, what we are doing is the same. And that kind of changed nowadays. And, and we only work like, like you guys do with the international standards because it just makes more sense. Um, the world became so big throughout the internet that um, we have to use the same specifications all over the world. I got you. So when you, when you bring these people into your workshop, how do you, I mean, like, where do you start? You know, cause most of them, like you said, they're hobbyists. They're coming in with like probably knowing absolutely nothing, but you know, they, they've got the opportunity to buy the gear. You I mean, where do you start with somebody like that? Uh, it's a little bit uh, tricky. Sometimes, you know, when I got like, um, like a bank employee here or a doctor or a vet or something like that, um, it can be really funny sometimes. Um, <laughs> Um, but I mainly almost start with how to set up a machine, um, you know, where to put the tick torch and just make sure that your gas cylinder doesn't fall and, and stuff like that. But you have to teach these simple things to people like that. Mm -hmm. They don't know that, a, that the argon cylinder is like a bomb. 
Yes. They say, they, they say, Hey, it's a little, it's a little cellular and what can happen? And I say, Hey, if, Check if out this the video. Seems, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and that's where we mainly start. And, and then I just take a big piece of steel, a big junk piece of steel. I clean the surface and let them take the tick torch and just start an arc. And then we just start like, you know, here, that's the arc and that's the halo around the arc. And I try to grab his hand while he is just holding the tick torch and watching at this arc and say, hey, that's the arc length we want. And now we start to weld. And then it's just like, you know, taking everybody on a welding course and, and here's a filler wire. No, don't dip it into your tungsten. No, don't stitch the filler wire into other people's eyes. And just like tick classes everywhere in the world, I think. No, with that's, beginners. that's awesome. That's exactly how I do it. So I'll take like when I, when we get into gas metal or gas tungsten arc welding, I'll take a, a three eighths plate, six inches by six inches. Yeah. And then I'll take all the mill scale off. We start on steel because obviously it's the cheapest and, they're going to screw things up. So why not let them tear up, you know, cheap material and I'll put them eighth inch tungsten in there, set them at 125 amps, just, you know, straight DC negative and say, okay, we're going to do a togenous welding. The, yeah. the whole object is don't dip your tungsten and you can yeah, actually, right. you know, you can, and we use the foot pedal, obviously, you know, just lay into that foot pedal as far as it'll go. You're going to hit 125 amps max because that's what the machine set at and just do like a nice steady push throughout the entire piece. Yeah, and we and I have them layer layer the beads fifty percent, you know, so you get fifty percent overlap on every weld, and then we'll flip the plate over, take the mill scale off, and we'll do it again, and then I'll have them go back, you know, um, perpendicular, and I'll let yeah. them do that a couple of times until they get familiar with, you know, how to use the foot pedal, how to have something in their hand, you know, and then we'll slowly introduce filler metal to it, and say, yeah. okay, now here's the appropriate angle that you have to hold the filler metal to the TIG torch. Otherwise, you know, you're going to experience these issues, uh, but then just show them how to dip the filler metal. Yeah. And then we start reducing thickness. So we'll start off at three eighths plate and then we'll go down to a uh, quarter inch and then eighth inch and we'll do fillets and groove welds and lap joints and T joints and just kind of go through the whole gamut that way. And then I'll switch it up and say, okay, now that you have the fundamentals, the basics where you can operate the foot pedal, the TIG torch and the filler metal kind of independently, but also all as one. Now we get into stainless. And then once they get through stainless, they're like, man, I'm, you know, I'm king shit on turd mountain. I got this. Yeah. And, and then I throw <laughs> aluminum at them just right into standard T joints and lap joints and all that stuff and say, okay, now let's do it with aluminum and aluminum reacts. It's, it's a complete, as you know, it's a completely different animal. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's going right. to take in heat completely different. It's, it's much higher, uh, thermally conductive, you know, so it gets hot a lot faster. Yeah, and, and you're just kind of watching them go through that whole process. So it, it sounds like you teach it very similar over there. Break it yeah, down to the right. fundamentals, you know, yeah. put the training wheels yeah. on and kind of let them just figure out how to establish a puddle and, and get that moving and develop a consistency with it. Yeah, what I really like to do is, um, you know, when you do the, the autogenous stuff and um, they got that pretty good. And when it comes to filler wire, um they just hold the tick torch and, and move steady forward. Don't dip the tungsten into the puddle. And I come in with the filler wire and dip yep. the filler wire for them. Um, so they don't, don't uh, get it wrong. And um, it just happened like early December. I had a student here, um, man, um, we take some from grooves with an angle grinder into the plate. And you know, like really deep grooves. So I said, just take that groove and weld straight. No filler wire, just the torch, a paddle straight over that groove. Man, and that didn't, that guy didn't get it. He always made a full circle. And <laughs> I said, and I said, hey, hey, um, do you have problems with your eyes? No, no, my eyes are great. I, I don't have problems with my eyes. And I said, okay, you, you don't learn anything here. You're wasting money. Go back, go to a doctor and, and, and call me a few days later. And then when you've got something done to your eyes, um, we can redo this workshop because so it doesn't make sense. I have a six hour workshop and in this six hour workshop, I teach them how to weld steel 
stainless and aluminum so okay. um, it's it's pretty pretty fast and hardcore stuff for them and you know the the customer called me one week later and said yeah man yeah you were right i i had a problem with my eyes and and i couldn't see small stuff so um he came back you know like um one week later and and was um with some glasses and uh, yeah we did the course and then it all went good but um sometimes you've got people like that you have to take to a doctor to teach welding <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Art Junkies podcast is brought to you by Stronghand Tools, makers of heavy-duty welding tables, toggle clamps, and fabrication tooling to help you increase time, speed, and accuracy in your daily life as a welder and fabricator. And if you're a student, you can register your school right now for a free gift pack from Stronghand Tool when you go to stronghandtool.com backslash art junkies. Now let's get back into the show. Yeah, no, I, I've actually, I've had similar situations with students in the class and, you know, as they're going through a T-joint, you'll notice, and it, like as an educator teaching welding for the past like seven years, I've noticed that, you know, once they start making a hook in their weld, you know, once they start turning like a, a sharp left or a sharp right as they're welding, they need glasses. Yeah. And it's, it's hard for, you know, because it, it humbles a lot of people because they're like, no, I don't, I don't need any vision correction and it's the funny thing is it's not even older students it's not even like the the guys that are like 40 50 years old it's like some of these kids that are coming out of high school and it's like i I had a kid two terms ago and it's i was like um you might need to go see an ophthalmologist like go go get your eyes looked at and make sure that you don't need reading glasses and the kid's like i'm fine i've got perfect i've got 2020 vision i was like when's the last time it was checked out uh, you know, I don't know. I've, I've a couple years ago and I was like, go see, you know, go see a doctor, go see an eye doctor yeah. and just, yeah. just, you know, just humor me on this. And like, so he told his mom, Hey, you know, I got to go. My, my instructor told me I need to go see a, a, an eye doctor and sure as shit. If he didn't show back up the following Monday with a pair of glasses. And right after that, we were able to correct everything he was doing wrong. He knew, <laughs> he knew the fundamentals. He knew the, the, the principles, the concepts, everything. <laughs> And he kind of had the right motion, but he could not stay in the weld joint. You know, yeah. we're, we're doing a T-joint. And then the next thing you know, he's going like vertical up on the plate. And it's like, no, 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 no. The, the weldment's over here, man. You're like, you've got to stay in, in contact with this. I could, I could see, you know, you trying to run classes and people show up with their pride. And they don't want to go get eyeglasses or don't think they need yeah. eyeglasses. Yeah, that's right. Or, or they're like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask them all the time. Do you wear glasses when you read? Well, yeah. Okay, you're going to need glasses when you weld. Really? I, I can see the light. You don't need to see the light. You need to be able to see the yeah. joint, you know, so that yeah. when you're tying that light into it, you can see exactly what the hell you're doing. Yeah. Now, that's, that's pretty cool I, that you experience the same stuff over there that we do over here. Yeah, that's right. Um, with the, this customer, um, you know, when you've got a, a tick arc, um, you have the, the primary arc and you have this, this halo around the arc, yep. which is mainly ionized gas who starts to act like a light bulb or something like that. And the guy said, Hey, there is something in that light. I couldn't see that before. So he just saw the light and was doing like something and, uh, oh, really crazy, really crazy. But same problems here as over you in the U S I think. Yeah. And the funny thing is like, I'm 39 now. And even with like, I do a lot of like low amp TIG welding, like yeah. 30 amps. And I, I have 20, 20 vision. I like, I have to get my, my vision checked every three years to, to maintain my CWI cert. But when I do low amp TIG welding, I've found myself that if I throw a 1.5 cheater lens in there, you know, I can, I can see things so much better, but I still have 20, 20 vision, you know? So, and, and that's the only process that, you know, I need to use a cheater lens is low amp TIG welding. You know, if I'm welding 125 amps on, on gas tungsten, no problem. I can see it all day long. But when I'm like trying to weld, uh, eighth inch diameter metal, uh, yeah. for different things. And I'm, I'm hitting about 30 amps for, you know, some of the micro welds that I'm putting on there. I'll, I'll throw a cheater lens in. I got an outlaw hood here at the home or here at the house. And I'll, I'll throw a cheater lens in there just because, you know, it, it, it gives me, you know, a little bit closer to where you can see that arc and you can see that halo, you know, because yeah. at, at 12, 14 inches out, it's, it's hard to see that sometimes. So just throwing a cheater lens in there, swallowing my pride and you know just accepting that hey if you want to see this you might need some you know a little bit of correction or a little bit of assistance in there 
Yeah, I had the same situation um, on this um, like welding box blades or cutter blades yeah. challenge on Instagram. Yep. And uh, I said, hey, I, I tick weld for so many years. Um, I can do that. So I set my machine um, like six or seven amps and the pulse frequency around 200 hertz. So really high pitch, which makes the arc more acting like a plasma arc and, and become really narrow. And I started the first weld on the box cutter blade and man, that was nothing. I also had to get a cheater lens and <laughs> do that stuff. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you what, like most people that do the um, the razor blade challenge, they're doing butt welds on there. But if yeah. you really want to throw yourself for a loop, try doing an outside corner joint on one of those things <laughs> or an inside corner joint. Just do like a filler yeah. weld on them and that, that'll humble you real quick. Yeah, yeah. That could be pretty challenging. Yeah, I, I found that the best way to do a lot of those is to run uh, a 1 16th diameter filler metal. Ah, okay. And I keep all of the heat on the filler and just let the filler metal melt off into the blades. Yeah, yeah. And and that's just because like, I can I can I think I run right around twenty to twenty five amps with yeah. a, with a one sixteenth diameter, and I keep all the heat on the filler metal and just let it melt and flow off into the uh, into the razor blades or the box cutters. Yeah, it's more like like tick breathing than tick welding in that situation. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know it, it works out pretty good. Oh, that's really cool. I think I have to try that in a few days. Give it a shot. It's the same thing with, um, uh, have you done the, like the, uh, the soda can challenge or what do you, what do you guys call soda over there? Cause over here in the States, it's like South of the Mason Dixon line. We call it soda. And then North of the Mason Dixon line, we call it pop like uh, uh soft drinks. Uh, and then in Texas, yeah, yeah. Texas, no matter what the hell you get, it could be a Sprite. They call it a Coke. It's weird. <laughs> they're, they're a different breed of people over there, but like, yeah. So like uh, pop cans or beer cans, um, yeah, I have tried, you tried that, that one. Um, yeah, yeah, I um, tried it like you know one year ago, and um, uh, it went pretty, pretty bad. And and like some weeks ago, it was in in, in fall in November, or I think I want to do that again. Mm -hmm. So um, I take to like Red Bull thing and and then just take off with some scotch sprite um the anodized part of yes. the aluminum and um, which is the, the biggest trick on that you have yep. to know that they're anodized and and then it went pretty cool but if you don't know that the stuff is anodized and you try to weld the stuff with a straight arc and oh man it's pretty big mess yeah i'll take like um so when i when i do the, the soda can challenge because I'll, I'll always show students and, you know, because they're like, hey, can you weld, you know, two aluminum cans together? Like, yeah, go get me two aluminum cans. Uh, but, like, I'll take, a, uh, like, a high-grit sandpaper, like 220, and I'll take yeah. that aluminum, aluminized coating off. And then uh, same thing on, the like, the inside of the part. Clean that all off, hit it with Scotch-Brite really good, wipe it down with acetone, and then I'll poke a hole in one of the cans. Yeah, yeah, so Be so you don't get the bump yeah, when you, you get that pressure close. built up. It, it blows yeah. the weld out. And then just, yeah. like, put two heavy objects on either side you know, to hold everything nice and tight together. And then the same thing, I'll either use like a, a 1 16th or I'll, I'll peel off some uh, 045 diameter wire from one of the MIG spools. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll run that. And I'll, I think I run that like right around 20 amps with uh, probably about 70% DCEN or uh, yeah, about 70% ECD or DCEN. And then, uh, and then weld that with a, uh, with a pulse. Yeah. Like one and a half to two pulses per second. And it, it usually turns out pretty good. And then run that frequency, <laughs> jack that frequency up about 200 hertz, and uh, it lays in there like nice and smooth. And they're like, "Man, that's okay. Let me try it." And then they're over there blowing holes in there because they cut corners on the prep. Yeah, that's the biggest that's, thing um, is the prep. But it's pretty amazing that these um, these like we call it Instagram challenges or, or social media challenges um, are so popular all over the world. You know, when I've got somebody here for a tick workshop and then um, mainly in the master classes where they already can weld, they came to me and, Hey, can you weld box color blades? Can you weld like two cans and all this stuff like that all around the world is the same. Yeah. You, Pretty cool stuff. You need to make like a little board for your shop with all the Instagram challenges up there. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it just put like you know here's here's the aluminum can here's the razor blades here's the diamond challenge like here's here's all the, the dodecahedron the 20 sided uh little 3d puzzle that you can do and just like yeah. have that up on a little board and be like yes i can i can do all this and i can show you how to do it 
Yeah, we had a, a cool challenge here in Germany. Um, we take some one millimeter filler wire and uh, put two pieces of filler wire next to each other. Um, then weld the two filler wires in the butt weld. And uh, man, that was pretty hard. Um, my machine was at four amps, I think, three or four amps. Oh, and damn. Yeah, it did turn out pretty well, but um, man, there were so many messages. How did you do that? What's the trick? And I got my machine down to one amp. It doesn't work. And you have to be really fast. You have to take a big Fupa cap and then, uh, you know, big piece of copper around that shit and really a lot of tricksing and, and just for doing this little challenging stuff. Yeah. So I think uh, OTC Daihan. Uh, just came out with a machine with uh, with Rush Kane, the RK shit. Uh, I should know this, like the RK two hundred machine for Rush Kane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it's it. It's got a it's got a one amp. Uh, I think one amp AC or I'm sorry, one amp DC and three amp AC start. Yeah, but yeah, you're you're talking about welding two pieces of three sixty fourth wire together. That's yeah, got a, that's, that's a hell of a challenge. I got to check that yeah. out. I got to try that. Yeah, um, I think you can find it on my on my Instagram site, and um, you know my Weco starts at uh, at three amps, I think, and that's what I use. But on this machine, if I have three amps, I can give pulls to this three amps. That would yeah, that makes sense. So I, I take the three amps and give like two hundred or no, oh, it was a little bit more. It was like thousand hertz of pulls. Holy shit. Uh, so um, it was not really tick welding anymore. It was like, like micro plasma plus. welding. Yeah, yeah. micro plasma welding. Yeah, I, yeah. I, as I tell students all the time because they, they get on the machine and they're like, well, how far can I turn the, the hertz up on this thing? And I was like, dude, look, you're going to want to stay around 20 or I'm sorry, like 240 hertz. Anything after that, that's where that's where the robots play. Because like yeah. the the human interface, you know, you just don't have that type of skill. You you can in some aspects. Don't get me wrong, but like most of the time, anything above two hundred and forty hertz, you know, or two twenty five, somewhere right around there, that's where the robots play. Like, yeah, stay exactly. within your wheelhouse. I mean, unless you're getting into, like you said, like trying to do like a plasma type weld with uh, with the gas tungsten arc welding system. Yeah, but I think um, you know I've got customers came here and say, hey, this machine can go up to two thousand hertz, and the other machine can do two five, which is better. <laughs> Don't care about it. Yeah. Don't care about it. Um, me personally, I think for my ears, uh, like hundred <laughs> hertz are enough, and um, it's plenty. Yeah, yeah, but but these guys who who want to weld with five hundred hertz or thousand hertz, my hand doesn't make sense. You have any benefit from that? Right. I remember the first time I got introduced to, uh, you know, being able to adjust my hertz because, like, I came from a background of iron working, and then I got into education and had access to all these pieces of equipment that could do all these advanced processes and advanced settings. Like, I ran a uh, Miller Synchro Wave for. For years, an old DC, you know, yeah. AC DC rectifier, and like I go in here and like I can adjust my hertz. Okay, what the hell does that actually do? And like going through and we crank the pulse up as far as it would go, crank the hertz up as far as it would go, and we're over there in the lab welding. And I had teachers from like all the other programs like just running through the door, like hey, there's a, there's a fire in the school because it sounds on like yeah. it sounds like an alarm going off. But I got four yeah. of these machines going with four students on them. And we maxed everything out, and it's just like the most annoying sound you'll ever hear on Earth. And they were yeah, freaking yeah. out, thinking the building was on fire because the alarm was going off. <laughs> That's pretty pretty hard, um, but it's right. You know, who knew needs like like these frequencies? We don't need these while welding, right? Um, not when welding by hand. I think uh, what I really like to do is when we're talking about stainless welding, I like to set like twelve or eighteen hertz. Um, most people hate me for doing this <laughs> because. These are frequencies um, which can get you mad in your helmet. Oh, yeah. It makes just this, this flickering, and, and it's a frequency. Um, I have a good buddy uh, who's also um, owning a welding shop and, and selling welding machines. Um, I visit him like every three weeks or so. And I came into his shop last time, I go to a tick machine, just lay the torch 
on a piece of shit and do these 12 hertz welding. And man, that guy really, really gets thick from that. He can't walk and then it's just like, oh man, I have to sit and stop that shit. And it's always funny to do that. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's like watching freaking anime on uh, on TV and stuff. It's like, yeah. you got to put a seizure warning out there. I, 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 yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about because I got a buddy that uh, he welded for Mitsubishi power systems for a number of years, both in field and like in the shop. And he prefers like a one to 1. 1.5 hertz when with all his DC <laughs> negative TIG welding. And I yeah. prefer like, I prefer 10 Hertz. And so like, uh, which is also a pretty, pretty. Yeah. So like one Hertz, you know, it's, it's kind of manageable, you know, like one to 1.5. It's just like a little bet, bet, yeah. you know, like yeah, a, exactly. a little flicker. But when you put it up to 10, it starts like throwing him for a loop, man. He gets like motion sick and shit like that. And it's like, yeah, he, he can't. But like, I, I don't know. I prefer like 10 Hertz with a lot of the stuff that I do. Yeah. I like that too. Um, I think you've, you've got one even on stainless. You make the paddle like like really really like honey. Mm -hmm. It's not so like water anymore. It's right. more like honey, and and you can module the paddle in any form you want to. Yes, and I'm, that I'm, only works on this shit frequencies. Uh, no, one hundred percent. I because like I I I, I tend to I weld at a lower amp typically. You know, if, unless I'm following a procedure. Um, I tend to weld at a lower amp because I weld a little bit slower, you know? Yeah. So like, uh, like for instance, like my stick welding, I'll run vertical up on a three eighths plate at 110 amps and everybody's like, Oh no, that, that's too low in amperage. It's not when you start calculating heat input, I'll, yeah. I'll pass a D one, one, three G, you know, 10 out of 10 times on 110 amps going vertical up because I weld a little bit slower. So my heat input is much higher. It's kind of yeah, like uh, right. doing a stringer versus a weave. You know, with a weave, you've got a lot higher input because you're moving a lot slower. Whereas if you yeah. run a stringer, you know, you have less heat input, you know, because you're, you're moving a little bit quicker. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I prefer to weld a little bit slower. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm a big guy. I like to, I don't like to move really, really quick. So if I, if I dial my, my machine back a little bit, I can move a little bit slower, concentrate. And, you know, like, so running at 10 hertz you know, I can slow that down. It's like you said, it's like running on honey versus water, you know, because I, yeah. I run a little bit slower. It's a, it's a little bit better for me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, um, for me, it's like when I'm welding stainless, I, I like to weld slow when I do weld art or, or welds that have, um, a decorative, uh, factor, they have to look good. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just laying a root pass and just want to be fast, um, I'm a really, really fast welder. So that's why I have uh, tick machines with 450 amps here in my shop at a home shop, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Like I think, um, out of all the machines I have, I got three machines in my shop and like the highest I can hit is about 250 amps. Yeah. But I'm not that's welding on anything crazy. Yeah. That's just the Sandler thing. I, I, I said here in Germany, it's like a 200 amp machine is, uh, the most common tick machine. Mm -hmm. Um, the next step is like a 300 amp machine and, uh, some weeks ago I said, Hey, uh, there's a 450 amp machine not far away from here. I have to get that machine. And I bought that machine and, and it's some really crazy shit. <laughs> but I mean, you guys run like, like standard, your outlets in your homes are like 240 volts, right? Ah, uh, that's not always right. Um, you've got like in, in Germany, we have a three phase in every house. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, I, don't, uh, I don't have three phase in my house. I get single phase. Yeah, we have we have uh, three phase in, in the in every house, um, but mainly um, the kitchen is three phase, Holy and shit. every 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 standard outlet is one phase, two hundred and thirty. Yeah, but it's no problem in Germany to have a three phase hooked up into your shop because you already have the line coming into your house again. Oh yeah, no. If I wanted to run three phase in my shop, I'm looking at like a minimum of ten grand. Like just to yeah, have that I, at my house. F some years ago, I started watching YouTube videos uh, from the US and I, s I saw these face generators. Yeah. Like boxes with a, with a motor on it. And, and I thought, man, what are these things? And, and then I realized that many people in the US only have one face coming into the house. Yeah. That's, that's all um, I've got coming into my house is single phase. I get, I get 110. 
for most of my outlets to like charge my cell phone, run a blender, coffee yeah. pot, whatever, microwave. And then I've got 220 out in the garage or, you know, like in the kitchen to run my oven and my dryer. So like yeah. anytime I want to weld, I got to unplug my dryer, piss my wife off because for some reason, the only, <laughs> the only time I want to weld is when she's doing laundry. <laughs> so I got to unplug the dryer to like fire up my, my 255 EXT. And it's like, you know, like I got to schedule my welding around her laundry or, you know, she's got to schedule her laundry while my welding. Uh, but yeah. yeah, three phase, that's like, there's no way I'm running three phase into my house. I mean, I can get like, uh, I think American Rotary. Uh, my buddy um, down the street, Jim Bollinger, he's got like uh, a three phase inverter in his garage where he can take that 220 and step it up to, you know, 300 amps or yeah. in, inside of his shop. Or he can run three phase in his shop because he's got the American Rotary uh, kind of like a step up yeah. to be able to do that. Because he, the same thing, you know, he doesn't want to pay 10 grand to hire the electric company to come run down and run three phase into his shop. Well, that's some pretty crazy stuff. Um, it was pretty annoying to me to see um, that uh, the U.S. only have one face coming into the house. And uh, the first times I didn't understand that. I said, hey, how do these guys run their machines at home? <laughs> And you know, my shop, even for, for German um, specifications, my shop is a little bit crazy. Um, I live in an old farm mm -hmm. and uh, it's a, like a 200 year old farm where I build a new house inside this old cage, you can say. And um, back about well, seven years ago when I started to build this thing and I go to the electrician guys um, at the city and said, hey, I want 55 amps on every face holy so shit. i've so you know on every face is a three face they come into my house i can blast 55 up to 60 amps at 60 amps per face things start to get a little bit crooky at the neighbors <laughs> um the light goes a little bit <laughs> a little bit darker but um that's even some crazy shit for for a house here in germany yeah, I mean, like, if I want to see that type of amperage and shit, I, like, I got to go to an industrial setting, you know, where they got yeah. three phase coming in. And even then, most of them are wired up to, like, a 30-amp breaker. Yeah. That's freaking so, nuts. So, the normal house here in Germany has, like, 30 amps um, for the three phases. Damn. So, when I go to them seven years ago and said, hey, I want 55 or 60 they said, man, are you crazy? What are you doing? And at that time, well, I had a in my garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And at that time, I had a really big lathe. I had a really big engine lathe here in my shop. And um, it had like a 30 horsepower motor on it. And when you push a button, you know, my next neighbor is like one kilometer away from me. So I ben barely see his light in the dark when, when I'm looking out of my window. But when I push the button of that lathe, his house starts to get really dark. And five minutes after that, he called me, hey, you man, did you, did you turn your lathe on? Yeah, I did turn my lathe on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got no TV, but it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, my TV's out, my Wi-Fi's out, my wife's bitching because yeah. the laundry can't get done. <laughs> yeah. That was really cool, but uh, I sold that machine. It was a little bit too big. A little for too much for a residential room. home? Yeah, yeah. Damn. So let, let's let's switch. Do you still have time? Because I, I know it's kind of late where you're at. Oh, it's no problem. Okay, perfect. Let's, let's talk cup sizes. So like uh, when you're doing uh, most of your steel and stainless, like what, what size cups are you using? And then when you switch to aluminum, what size cups do you prefer? Well, when I weld steel, it's mainly the, the number seven or number eight with the gas lens. Okay. Um, just the standard um, on a 20 style torch. And they're not long. They don't need much gas. And for steel, it doesn't have to be that perfect. Uh, sometimes I like to use a Jazzy 10 mm -hmm. from, from Michael Furyk, which, yeah. which I really like. When it comes to stainless, my main cup is the FUPA 12. Okay. I I think that that little little cup became a standard in the worldwide industry. Yeah. Um, I've got customers where where um, their foreman don't want to buy these stuff and they buy that private and then take it to the to the work and then weld with the fupa and man these things are great and when it comes to titanium of course you need it bigger I use a 
like a, a BBW or or something bigger, and a trail shield cap from from other guys. Um, so I've got a good coverage. But aluminum is special. Yeah, aluminum is, is it's a different animal, right? Yeah, my, yeah. My buddy, um, and, and I wanted to ask this question because I wanted to get your interpretation over there in Europe because my buddy uh, Brian the Gallio. Uh, he's based out of here, Newport Ritchie, and he he did like a, a different, you know, some tests running yeah. different diameters of cup sizes, and it, it created a whole lot of debate. So I'm interested to hear your take on, you know, uh, different cup sizes based on aluminum. Yeah, you know, when it comes to welding aluminum, we all want that sharp frost line yeah. of the cleaning action. We don't want a, a really wide cleaning action on our weld bead. It doesn't look good. So I'm just a standard five guy. I don't use nice. a gas lens. Right. Um, we did some tests here as well. Um, we take a number eight cup and a gas lens. Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, we want to bring the balance down so that we get that frosty line really, really small. It's no problem for dial a machine and then you are like, you know, the balance is at 90% EN or 95% EN maybe. It's no problem to get a good looking weld, but you get porosity. You always get porosity when you try to weld with a number eight cup, a gas lens, a 2.4 millimeter tungsten and look, made it look like a number five weld. It doesn't work. And what I also discovered is um, it's a little bit strange because it's, it's just gas coverage. It's not, it's not like, like changing the size of the paddle. It's only the gas. But if you use a number five standard color, you've got more penetration over to a gas lens system. Um, that's one of the, the biggest improvements, I think, when you've got a 200 amp machine and you've got a pretty big part and you can not really preheat your part and you have to push out the maximum of your machine. Always use the number five, go down to 50 hertz and you're good to go. Nice. So 50 hertz, you say? Yeah, when you have to push the max out of a machine, um, you know, you have 60 hertz in, in, in the US. Right. And, and here in Germany, our standard, what's coming out of the outlet is 50 hertz. Okay. So I say when you want to push the maximum out of your machine, number five cap, so you've got small cleaning. Small cleaning means more penetration mm -hmm. and just low frequency to push the maximum out of the machine. Nice. Yeah, because now that with the, once again, with the different technologies that's come in with welders, we can adjust that, that frequency much lower than what we typically get out of our outlets or yeah, yeah. much I higher. Yeah, I think with my, my WECO, I can go to 20 hertz. Yeah, 20 hertz is, is the lowest nice. on that machine. Okay. So, yeah, because you know, that's like the biggest misconception is like, oh, well, you know, because everybody sees the the Michael Fury cups in which he makes a great freaking product. The, the Jazzy 10, the BBW, the, the Moose yeah. Knuckle, like all those great for steel, stainless titanium, you know, all those different types of uh, exotic alloys. But when we get into aluminum, I've, I've, I've heard, you know, kind of mixed reviews on running a gas lens at all. But most of the people that run like high-end aluminum, like really clean looking stuff, they're, they're running like a, a number five and number six cup, standard collar body. Yeah. I had this, um, this topic with guys all around the world. I um, I really was was interested how other people do it, and because when I look on YouTube or Instagram, um, most guys in the US have their standard five call it standard on the, on the torch and no gas lens. And I talked to you know Jody from from Welding Tips and Tricks mm -hmm. and uh, talked talked to Roy Crumrine and and everybody said, hey, I use a number five too. If I have a bigger tungsten, I use a, a number six. Right. If I if I have a really small tungsten, I use a number four, and that's what, what I prefer to. It's in my eyes, it's uh, the best thing you can do on aluminum. Even if you take, I made the test. Even if you take a long collet um, or a long gas lens and the cap, um, let's say a number five, really long, uh, and try to get the same effect out of a gas lens setup. It doesn't weld the same. Um, you know, you've got the same diameter of the of the exit from the 
um, from the cup, but it doesn't work with fame like the stand-up number five mm. with a colored body. Okay, because I got um, because I I've ran this test a couple times. Like typically when I do aluminum, I pick I, I determine what weld size I need to make, and then I'll just add an eighth of an inch. So yeah. if, if I need to run uh, a three sixteenths diameter or a three sixteenths width weld. I'll run like yeah. a number five cup because the, the, the numbers are based off of cup size. Is it? Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity, is it the same in, in Europe? Because you guys are on the metric system. So uh, do you use a number yeah. five for a five sixteenths weld or do you use, yeah, do you convert it to millimeters? There's, there's something really crazy on that. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, it's a really, really cool topic because, um, you know, um, you've got your CFH for gas flow. Right. You guys have um, what? Uh, we use we lose um, liters per minute. Yeah. So when you try to convert that, you know, uh, I know that uh, number five cup is around, I think five sixteenths of an inch or yes. that's the way I describe it to my customers um, here. Number five is like something inch, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to the gas flow, on the number five in the U S you guys take like 10 to 12 C of H. Mm hmm. For example, when we weld with a number five here in Germany, we have to use five to six liters per minute. So many people here in Germany think the number stands for the minimum of gas flow. I uh, got gotcha. you. And um, when I talk to, to employees or to customers and say, hey, this doesn't mean workflow or gas flow. It's just a crazy shit because they use the imperial system. We use the metric system. And for them, it's the size in 16th of an inch. Mm -hmm. But when you take this cap in Germany and say, okay, it's a number five, I have to use a minimum amount of five liters argon per minute. And so that's a pretty cool, cool topic, I think. Oh, no shit. So that, 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 that equation actually works out. So if we use like yeah. a five sixteenths over here, you're going to run five liters per minute over there. Yeah, Whereas that's right. I would probably run 12 cubic feet an hour. Yeah, that's right. That's fucking you know, cool. You know, the, the absolute minimum for a number five cup is like 10 um, CFH, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's what I say here. If you see a five on that, use five liters as a minimum. Take one liter more, which would be two T, uh, CFH mm -hmm. for your personal secure. You know, if somebody opens the door or stuff like that or goes by, um, take one liter or two CFH more. And right. that's how it works. It's a pretty, pretty fun fact, I think. It's a pretty slick freaking equation right there. It's like the one yeah. thing that adds up between like uh, imperial and metric. Yeah. That's cool. It's, so you guys really can use cool. it for the diameter of your cup as well as the cubic feet. Yeah. Um, it's, or the liters. It's, it's, yeah, the, the cool thing is just that so many people don't know that the number is the size in inch. Mm -hmm. They always say, hey, it's just gas flow. No. You have to you have to measure it with a caliper. And no, 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 that's wrong. It's the size in inch, and it's not anything with gas flow, but it's a, it's a fun fact that it works. Yeah, it's because the Americans are hung up on the imperial system, and they won't change. Yeah, that, yeah. That's pretty slick. No, but I, I was what I was going to say before leading me up to this conversation is my buddy uh, Rush Kane, he'll run a number five, but he swears up and down by a gas lens. And when you oh, look, that's crazy. When you look at his at, at, on his welds, and, and he converted me because like I ran that RK two hundred up at up at uh, Fabtech, and so I came yeah. home and I, I reached out to him on his uh, his new website Kane Industries, and I bought the the number five CK setup with a gas lens. And it, it actually runs pretty damn slick on a gas lens with aluminum. But it's, it's always uh, interesting to see other people's take on it. You know, I mean, obviously you can't run like your 30, 40 CFH on, uh, on, your, on your gas flow, but it, yeah. it still provides a great weld with a clean etching zone. And I think he's one of the few people that are running a gas lens on aluminum. Because my buddy uh, Mark uh, Winchester, he runs a standard collet body, number five, yeah. same thing. And you yeah, know, he, I, his welds are freaking clean as shit. You know, you look at this, the, the headers and the, the, the oil coolers and everything that he's doing. And it's like, it's, it's damn clean work. Yeah. I talked to Mark on Instagram. Um, he was one oh, yeah. of the persons uh, I wrote, um, uh, back in the days when I want to know that shit. And he just said, man, yeah, I use the number five too. And yeah. it's, it's the best way to go. And 
so many people use a number five and i tried it with a number five gas lens setup and uh, i could get it to work but i need and uh, i think i need about two or three c of h if i convert it more mm-hmm. than the standard color so i said hey why should i waste gas and if i have uh, like a, a customer here for my workshop they dip the tanks in all the time oh yeah I, <laughs> you, know, you know you you have to buy so many gas lenses and they are really expensive yep with a standard color body you just clean it and you're good to go yeah because like as soon as you contaminate with it with it with the gas lens and you can probably confirm this it jacks up your screen on yeah. your gas lens whereas with yeah. a standard color body there's there's really no effect you know you take tungsten out you clean it up you put it back in there you're good to go but uh, yeah, I've I've loaned students my uh, my Furic setups and my CK setups, you know when they're when they're doing some of their different work and it's like as soon as they contaminate or if they're running like the um, the valve switch on a yeah. on a TIG torch if they forget to turn the gas on and they strike an arc, it just it it completely fries the gas lens, and it's yeah, like yeah can... uh, I'm not gonna loan my students that shit until like the last week. Till I, I understand that they know how to actually operate, you know, turn the gas on before they strike an arc. Yeah, that's right. Or not contaminate. Um, yeah, and these parts are pretty expensive, and um, it doesn't have to be that a student uh, takes a Fury Cup and run it on AC, and you've got a big bump of aluminum inside a Fury Cup. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it makes a big difference in a standard collet body. That's why, like, most, most of the times at the school, I'll run standard collet bodies until... I know that they're like at that point and yeah. they say, okay, yeah, your, your, your wells are looking pretty good. Try this. And, you know, th- you know, throw them a gas lens and then they're like, yeah. holy shit. Like the, the, especially with like steel and stainless there's, and we do a little bit of Inconel as well. Um, yeah. There's a huge difference when you run like a, a number eight standard collar body versus like running a, a number 12 Furic when you get into stainless and Inconel. It's, it's just a massive difference. It's night and day. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then the students get big eyes and, whoa, man. <laughs> yeah, why, why didn't you show me this sooner? Because I didn't want you to tear this shit up because <laughs> it's about three times the price of a standard collet body. I can buy these things all day long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I really find out on, on when we came back to the standard five thing or mainly the, the aluminum thing, you know the, the wedge collets. Mm-hmm. We all love wedge collets because um, they are easy to use. They last like like two years or, or stuff like that. And but when I weld um, AC, I don't use a wedge collet. Really? When you really look um, close from the top on the cup and look how much the the tungsten is off center with a um, with a wedge collet. Um, I find that when you use a standard color, you can really center the tungsten in. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say, for example, like like your tungsten, because you're using a wedge color, is, is looking a little bit into the right side right. or to the left side. You've got a difference in cleaning action. Oh, damn. You, yeah, that's... And the, the frost line, um, I made some, some really, really thin aluminum parts like like for a little tank but it was really really small material um it had to be perfect and i took a caliper and um i measured on the on the one side of the bead and on the other side my frost line and it wasn't the same and i thought man where did this come from did i hold my torch maybe wrong or did i get an angle at my torch and no i did had not an angle at my torch it was the wedge colored which caused the tungsten to be not centered in the cup that makes that makes a hundred percent sense now i wonder because you you're you're saying it, it kind of kicks it off left to right i wonder if you could orient your your wedge collet into an up and down fixture and if that would alleviate yeah. it because yeah, now you're I not try, you're not left to right I, you're up and down i tried that um, I tried that like like looking in, in front of the weld or looking on the backside of the weld. Right. Um, and I let the tungsten look more in front of the weld, mm-hmm. which means that you've got less gas coming out in front of the tungsten. And I had big problems with the cleaning action in front of the puddle. Okay. Because, because the gas coverage wasn't correct anymore. 
damn, now we're looking and, at a microscopic and, level. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, when you when you got so deep and detail and, and tick processes, and uh, I the first moment I realized that fact, I took a standard um, call thing, and you know, with the with the slots in it. Yeah. And uh, I put that thing in and, and make sure my cup was really centered and, and everything went good. And it was a difference in the appearance of the weld and the frost line. Mm-hmm. And sometimes on some products, this is a, a little thing that, that makes the guy who buys that shit from you coming to your shop and not going to the other guy who mm-hmm. wears like shit. You know, on, on high quality products, I think just a little trick like this can can be a lifesaver yeah it definitely could now so have you tried it 180 degrees from a leading edge to a trailing yeah, edge yeah. what would it, what did it yeah. do at that point well and it makes uh, the paddle freeze earlier oh shit i you know i uh, make some arc shots as well um sometimes i post them on my instagram mm-hmm. page and um i made with arc shots and and watch these in slow motion okay so um uh, you know as me it's like you when i worked in the laboratory some years ago and doing all the testing stuff that's in my head i had to test stuff yeah. and I watched these in slow motion and yeah, there was a difference. I, I can tell with slow motion. Okay. It's, it's there. Yeah. And, um, that's like, like, you know, delivering the fact for the people who don't believe that. Yeah. But, um, so I, yeah, I, would, I, I would imagine on, I, on thinner material, that would be a benefit, but on thicker material that would, that would almost cause like issues. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, when you think of this, this little fun fact, um, think of optimizing a tick process. You mm-hmm. were really, really thin stuff. And you said, Hey, I turned my tungsten 180 to change the gas flow in front of the puddle. Yeah. And, and I love how, how deep and detail, um, tick welding goes when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. That's freaking cool. I, I like, and, and like, I nerd out on a lot of this shit. Uh, you know, like the, just the, the, the nuance of the different processes and what you can achieve and what you can't achieve. And, and, you know, the things that actually matter, like when we talk about a spray transfer, having to get yeah. into like an 82% argon composition and, and you'll have people that argue all the time that now I, I can get into spray transfer at, at 75, 25 gas. No, you can't. But I mean, like even just clocking your, you know, the collet body on your tungsten yeah. has such a dramatic impact and people will now. Now it doesn't, and it's like you've done the research. You've watched it in slow mo, and you can verify. Yeah, yeah. That just you know the position of 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 a wedge collet body over a standard collet, or I'm sorry, uh, the the wedge collet versus a standard collet. How yeah. that actually changes the overall appearance and you know of your weld. And I think that is what makes welding so special for me going, you know, like a mad professor um, and, or a mad doctors or scientists so deep into these processes and uh, looking at an arc like this is um, what makes me love the, the little fun facts of, of tick welding or welding in, in general, you know, um, 20 years ago, it was just like electricity and the piece of, of wire, which just came in, which came out and then forming two metals together. And nowadays, um, we look at this so specialized and, and so in detail that I really have to say it's, it's awesome how this all came out. Yeah. And I, I don't know about you, but like, that's the thing with me with welding is like, it's it's a rabbit hole. No matter which process you pick, there's there's a rabbit hole you can dive into and you can get much deeper into the fundamental understanding. Yeah. And like the chemistry and the metallurgy and all the shit that we didn't want to learn, like over here stateside anyway, the stuff we didn't want to learn when we were in high school, the math, the science, the the metallurgy, the chemistry, the stuff that didn't make any sense. Now I can I can start deep diving into those different aspects of it and understand welding at a, a deeper level. And that's yes, the coolest that's right. thing about welding is like the more you learn about welding, the less you actually know, you think you know about welding. 
because there's there's more science and there's more experiment or experiments that, that have backed up, you know, the, the thought process behind a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I've got in contact with Wolfram Industry, um, who who make tungsten, um, like you know, hundred years ago or so, and um, these guys are specialized in tungsten and i had a video call with them and i said hey i want to learn something about tungsten mm -hmm. not only the you know uh, two percent lanthanide or 1.5 lanthanide i want to go in detail and they said hey yeah we can hook you up and then we can show you something and um but we need eight hours of time and i said hey i just want to know something about tungsten <laughs> yeah yeah, we make tungsten. We do that stuff like 50 years ago, and we made the tungsten that um, that were used to weld the stuff from the NASA to to fly to the moon. And yeah, you know. And I said, okay, okay. And I took these eight hours, and man, 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 a freaking mind blowing stuff these guys told me. But um, after that, I got some time on my welding machine and just looked at my tungsten and started to think different about arc starts, about arc wandering. So, you know, um, it's going so, so deep in detail um, helps you in special situations when you have to weld critical stuff or you want to make the perfect weld because you've got the knowledge in your head and yeah. the experience. It's like when you try to explain, you know, the different balance, you know, with, yeah. with the tungsten electrode. It's like tungsten, pure tungsten melts at 5,280 degrees. And if you weld on DC positive, you're, you're putting 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit into that tungsten. Well, yeah. it melts at 5,280. Yeah, it's going to melt your tungsten the higher you go in balance. You know, so if you want more cleaning action, the higher cleaning action you go, the bigger diameter tungsten you need to an extent. Otherwise, it's going to melt your tungsten. It's like having that fundamental knowledge, you know, that, that makes you a better welder. And the cool thing is I, th I think they actually manufacture tungsten in Germany. So if you could team up with one of those companies and like actually tour their facility, I mean, you'd be like ages ahead of a lot of people. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, the, the point we had earlier with the um, two point, uh, two point uh, lanthanated, the yeah. blue tungsten, um, where I said um, the lanthium starts to burn from the tungsten mm -hmm. i've got this knowledge from these guys uh, you know they told me hey um you know that uh, thoriated tungsten thorium holds up to like so and so much degrees and and um that is information you don't get yourself you have to talk to like these expert guys who only do tungsten to learn this stuff yeah but it makes me a better welder and a better teacher. Yeah, that's like a lot of people trying to run, you know, pure tungsten on the inverter. Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's it's not good for the machine. And they're like, well, why? It's like, Fuck, I don't know. But there's there's people out there that, you know, manufacture this shit that have tested it. And they say it's not good to do it on the system. Yeah, we had this um, discussion also. Um, I have a lot of customers, you know, mainly from the hobbyist range who came in and, hey, I bought a machine and, and I have got two tungsten. I've got a gold and I've got a, a green. Okay, give me that green tungsten. We put it into the garage. Why? Everybody says green is for, for aluminum. No, it was back in the days on a transformer. Yeah, on a transformer um, rectifier, so, it's, it's a great, great setup. But on the inverter machine, you have a square wave. Mm -hmm. And for most reasons, or for most applications, we use square wave welding. And if you take a green tungsten, put it into that machine, that square wave won't be a square wave anymore. It always tries to become a sine, a sine wave. wave. Yeah. So, so it's right that you say um, you are destroying your inverter because you are you are pushing it to to something it doesn't want to do so don't use a green tungsten on an inverter machine but um, many people don't get that yeah you're, you're taking your mercedes now and you're, you're dropping it back down to a volkswagen yeah yeah, yeah that's right damn so uh, i was i was having a, a hard time explaining it to my instructors the other day because they're like oh no like green tungsten it's like no you don't want to use that on an inverter 
Yeah, it's, it's absolutely bullshit, but, um, you know, tick welding was, was uh, invented, I think, in the 50s or, or 60s, like, like Healy Arc welding. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they had to find a way to weld AC, and, and that's what worked. And the industry used the green tungsten for like 40, 50 years. And, and now we say, no, 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 don't use these. Um, they are not good for your inverter. Um, it's hard to get that out of the heads. Yeah. And that's the hard thing is like, you know, because most people, you know, they were, they were trained a certain way or, yeah. you know, they learned a certain way and they're not open to new technology and new things. It's like, you know, trying to get instructors to adopt uh, or, or just welders in general to adopt like cobot welding or new technology yeah. or, or like pulse transfer, you know, when all yeah. they've ever ran is short circuit yeah, or, you know, a, you know a, running pulse or, or, or a higher frequency, something other than like in the state side. 60 hertz or in european side 50 hertz trying yeah. to adapt and say hey you can change your frequency and you can stiffen up that puddle and, and drive that puddle a little bit more narrower and they're like yeah no no this is the way i've always done it and it's like you've you've got to break out from that mentality to become a better welder we have this um uh, little little um you know when in germany someone says we do that 20 years mm -hmm. and that's the way we do it um, in Germany, we say, hey, you can do something 20 years and you can do it 20 years wrong. We so have the think same it, thing stateside. So there's yeah, not a whole lot of difference. Yeah. So so think about it. And, and technology is, is not um, on the point of 20 years ago anymore. And, and try new things. Be open minded for new stuff. 100%. Well, damn, Christian, it's been an honor to have you on the podcast. I've really appreciated kind of talking about your story, get, diving deep into TIG welding or WIG welding, as you guys call it, uh, seeing the differences between, you know, how we do it in the U.S. and and how you guys do it over there in Europe and some of the similarities in between. It's uh, I, I want to thank you for your time coming on the podcast, um, you know, making yourself available because of the, the huge time difference that we've had to incur to, to get this episode on the books. Uh, but I really appreciate it, man. Tell everybody where they can find you, uh, especially I have a lot of uh, listeners in Europe and Germany. Uh, tell them where they can find you if they want to reach out and take some of your classes or, you know, just contact you one on one and uh, kind of get a more in-depth understanding of, uh, of wig welding. Well, uh, first, thank you for having me on. And it was a real honor to be on here on the podcast. And uh, if anybody wants to contact me, the easiest way always is Instagram. Um, just search for Deichwerkstatt and you'll find me on there. You're, you're going to have to spell that out, man. Oh, oh, I think I just wrote it in the Instagram story and sent it to you. That's the easiest way, I think. <laughs> okay. No, that works great, man. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. And uh, like I said, staying up late to be, able to, to be able to record this episode. Thank you, man. It was a really honor. I appreciate that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is all I have for you for this week's episode. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Just a Tip Tuesday right here on the Art Junkies channel. Be sure to stop by the website, artjunkies.com, and pick up some show merch and show your support for the show. I hope you all have a great week. Stay safe out there, and until next time, make every well better than your last.